Hello. Thank you for tuning in. This is the recording of the Indiana State Board of Accounts extracurricular training. This training is going to go over the statutes that apply to extracurricular treasures, as well as some auditing requirements and some compliance guidelines that they are required to follow. The current directors over schools and townships are myself, Chase Lennon, and my partner, Jonathan Weiniger. If you have any questions on the information presented in this PowerPoint, feel free to reach out to us. We have our contact information here. The best way to get a hold of us is by email. As you can see, the third bullet point, schools.townships at sboa.in.gov. Uh, this is a shared email account, and both of us have access to this. So if you have any questions regarding schools, townships, extracurricular accounts, just really anything in general that the Board of Accounts can help you with, please let us know. We also have a website where there's specific pages for each unit. We have a page for schools, which include all of our manuals, Indiana codes, presentations, including this one our YouTube page, etc., that you can look at for additional resources. Hello. Thank you for tuning in. This is a recording of the Indiana State Board of Accounts extracurricular training. This training is going to go over the statutes that apply to extracurricular treasures, as well as some auditing requirements and some compliance guidelines that they are required to follow. The current directors over schools and townships are myself, Chase Lennon, and my partner, Jonathan Weiniger. If you have any questions on the information presented in this PowerPoint, feel free to reach out to us. We have our contact information here. The best way to get a hold of us is by email. As you can see, the third bullet point, schools.townships at sboa.in.gov. Uh, this is a shared email account, and both of us have access to this. So if you have any questions regarding schools, townships, extracurricular accounts, just really anything in general that the Board of Accounts can help you with, please let us know. We also have a website where there's specific pages for each unit. We have a page for schools, which include all of our manuals, Indiana codes, presentations, including this one our YouTube page, etc., that you can look at for additional resources. If you are unaware of the State Board of Accounts, we were created in 1909 in response to widespread political corruption. We are a state of Indiana government agency, so we are the audit agency of the state. We perform audit and examinations of government units, including the state of Indiana, local units such as counties, cities, towns, townships, schools, special districts, and certain not-for-profit units who receive governmental funds. In the statute, we are also responsible for doing other duties, such as prescribing forms and procedures used by government units. And those forms and procedures are outlined in our compliance guidelines on our website. We do some other items such as recounts for elections. We provide training for local officials. We do consulting services and some other things. This is how we are currently set up at the Board of Accounts. We have a state examiner. It's currently Paul Joyce. We have two deputy state examiners. One of them is Tammy White, and the other one is Mike Bozemski. And in our central office in Indianapolis, we have directors over each unit type. We have two over each area, school and townships, cities and towns and special districts is another area, and then counties. Out in the field, for our auditors and field staff, we have audit coordinators, and beneath that we have audit managers, and then our field examiners. We also have two investigation coordinators that deal with special investigations, 
and they are responsible for dealing with identified fraud and any other non-compliance concerns that they deem need to have a special investigation. On this slide, if you need additional resources that are not found on our website, you can go to another state agency website, such as the Department of Revenue, the Department of Education, and those websites have additional information that can help you with whatever problem you're trying to solve. A large part of how the Board of Accounts interacts with local units is through Gateway. Gateway is a separate website online that's managed by IBRC, and that company is an affiliate of IUPUI, and they provide a platform where local units can report to the Board of Accounts, and then that reporting is made public. So there's annual financial reports, there is what's called the 100R, and that includes all of the salaries for public employees, in addition to a bunch of other applications, one of which is the ECA risk report. The ECA risk report is required to be filed to the Board of Accounts through Gateway, and it assesses the risk for audit planning purposes for different extracurricular accounts, and it provides us information on if there is an issue at a unit, then we can reach out and then help that unit. Once you log into Gateway, uh, this is how the extracurricular report will appear. The school treasurer is ultimately responsible for submitting this information, but generally the extracurricular treasurers are the ones to input this information. The first section in the Gateway ECA Risk Report is the Risk Assessment section, and it asks questions like how is the ECA ledger maintained? Is it in a computer system or in a manual ledger, which would be uh, paper records? Uh, it goes through and asks other questions like is the bank account reconciled? Do they use our prescribed forms? Do they have any investments? And things like that. So once they answer these questions, they can continue to the next section. The main section of the annual report for ECAs is the schedule of balances, receipts, and expenditures. Here they could either upload or manually enter information, and this would be the financial information which would include the balance of all of the ECA funds. So we're asking for the name of the fund, the, the balance, the total receipts for the year, the total expenditures for the year, and then the ending balance. After all that is entered, they can continue on to the cash reconcilement section. This section 
pulls forward the information that was entered in the fund section and uses that to verify if the ECA account is reconciling. So the information entered in here would be for the school year ended most likely at June 30th, but some ECAs have different year ends depending on how they operate. So here you would just do a basic reconcilement. You would add any extra cash on hand, deposits in transit, add or subtract for any other reconciling items, and then deduct your outstanding checks. So the fund balance on the ECA ledger throughout all those additions and reductions should equal the balance that they have in the bank. We do have an upload option for outstanding checks, but you can also enter those manually if you don't have very many outstanding checks at the end of the year. So once you're done with this section, you can move on to the report certificate. The report certificate is essentially a certification saying the name of the bank account, when the school closed for the year, with information about the surety bond of the treasurer, which would be the ECA treasurer. And then there are requirements in statute where the ECA risk report, we call them the forms SA 1 through 5. I'll be going over these forms later in the presentation, but once Gateway is filled out, we have implemented a report output process where once the information is all put in there, they can generate reports that will contain the SA 1 through 5, and then that would be the report that the ECA treasurer would then give to the school treasurer, and then they would give that to the, the board. And at the bottom of the screen, it shows where copies of this report are supposed to be filed at. Here are copies of the forms in our manual. This is an example of the SA 5-1. And this is just the schedule of balances, receipts, and expenditures. So the information in this report would come from that main section that you filled out in the ECA risk report. This is the SA 5-2. This report's going to include the cash reconcilement section with all the outstanding checks that were entered. In the SA3, that's going to detail all the receipts and expenditures by fund. And that's also going to be pulled from the financial information that was uploaded in Gateway. SA5-4 is just that certification that we just spoke about. And these do need to be signed by the treasurer and the principal of the extracurricular account to verify what they input into Gateway is correct and matches the records. In Gateway, there are submission rights where the treasurer of the school corporation, as I mentioned earlier, is responsible to submit the actual report. But if you would like anyone other than the school corporation treasurer to input this information, you would need to complete an ECA delegation of authority form. I have linked this form in the second bullet point. You can fill this out, scan it, and email it to our Gateway team. Also, if you have any problems with Gateway, technical or password reset or things like that, you can email our Gateway team at gateway 
at sboa.in.gov. So after inputting all this information and submitting, then you will have the ability to print out those SA-5 reports. There is a directive, and it's somewhat new, that went out in 2018. It's State Examiner Directive 2018-1. And what a directive is, is it's additional requirements that the State Examiner of the Board of Accounts can issue where units have to follow. And this one in particular deal with monthly uploads. So we are trying to be more efficient and have our audits be more cost effective and having information uploaded to us throughout the year helps us plan our audits, identify risk, and perform procedures before we even go on site at the unit. So extracurricular accounts are included in this directive and they have to upload items to us monthly. In addition, this upload process allows us to proactively identify problems. So if we see that you aren't reconciling correctly or you're having issues with your records, we can see that and we can have someone reach out to your office and try to correct those issues before we even get there to audit. Each of these monthly uploads are due by the 15th of each month and it would be 45 days after that month to submit the information is when it was due. So for example, January, the monthly uploads for January would be due in March before March the 15th. For schools and counties, this directive applied and started January of 2019. We also receive questions about the annual upload section. So if you go into the monthly uploads portal, you'll see there is uploads by month. And then at the bottom, there's one called annual uploads. And when we say annual, for schools at least, this means the fiscal year end. And most schools' fiscal year end is June 30th. So these annual uploads, they are due by August 29th. Please don't confuse this with a calendar year where we've seen some units upload the annual files to us in January and we're really looking for the, the June ending for the year information to be uploaded in August. For ECA accounts, we are asking monthly that they upload bank reconcilements. So this would include all the supporting documentation, not necessarily all of the detail, but what we want to see is the, the bank statement and then your reconciling document. So if you do this in Excel or some other program, we want to see you go from your ledger balance all the way through to your bank account balance. Now in the ECA risk report, as you saw earlier in the presentation, we ask for your reconciliation for the year end, but this would be for each month. We would like to see supporting documentation showing that you are reconciling every month. The second item we're asking the ECAs to upload monthly would be the funds ledger. So this would be similar to the information input into the ECA risk report every year, but we want this to be uploaded monthly so we can do testing throughout the year. So this would summarize the, the fund balance, the beginning fund balance, with receipts, disbursements, and then the ending balance for all the funds kept in the ECA ledger. We have some resources on the website. I do not think many ECAs have manual records anymore, but if 
you do have an extracurricular account and they keep everything on an old paper ledger or really long book, then you can use our upload template. This is mostly for townships and special districts and smaller units of government. The main thing that I want to direct you to here was the Gateway Upload Application section on our website. If you scroll down on the school page, there is a section that links the user guide, some templates, and just some frequently asked questions and other things that could assist if you run into any problems when uploading this information. For the annual uploads, this is the list of documents that we're requesting annually. And again, this would be for the fiscal year ending in June. We'd like to see the year-end bank statement. And if you already included this bank statement in your monthly section with your reconcilement, that's okay. Feel free to upload it again or a statement saying that this is in the June monthly uploads. We just want to make sure that you have a copy of your bank statement because you don't necessarily need a copy of the bank statement to show us that you're reconciling, but it is additional support for us. We also want to see the year-ending outstanding checklist, the year-end investment statements, and then detail of receipt and a detail of disbursement activity. And the detail of receipt and disbursement activity, this would be a report from your system for all the receipts that you received for this year, and then another report for all the disbursements that you made for this year. And these may be large reports depending on the size of your ECA and how active the ECA account is. Uh, it, that is okay. I think we have a very large file upload limit, and we haven't ran into any problems in the past. So those are the reports we are looking for for those last two. So now that we went over Gateway and the Board of Accounts just in general, I'd like to go over the ECA statutes and our opinion from an audit standpoint of how the ECA should be complying with those statutes. So the ECA treasurer is the custodian of the ECA accounts. And for many of these statutes going forward, I'm going to, or I have already pasted these statutes here. And then the slide directly after the statute, I kind of summarized what it means, at least from a standpoint of being in compliance. So Indiana Code 20-41-1-3 that deals with the custodian responsibilities. And what the statute says is generally that ECA accounts may be used for an athletic, social, class, or other school function. What ECA accounts cannot be used for is for anything that's educational in nature. 
and this is a common question that we receive if certain funds are allowed to be kept in the ECA accounts or the school corporation records. And the question that you should ask yourself if you come across that question is, are the funds educational in nature? Are they used in the classroom to provide education for the students? If the answer is yes, they should not be in the extracurricular accounts. They should be held in the school corporation accounts. So if it's for an extracurricular activity, after school function, like athletics, a social group, a class group, where class funds, you could have the junior class, the senior class, etc. Those would be examples of items in the ECA records. Additionally, ECA accounts, you cannot account for items or funds for outside organizations. So, for example, parent-teacher organizations, booster clubs, anything outside of the school that's a separate not-for-profit entity or some parent group, you cannot account for those because it's not under the school's purview. It doesn't fall into that definition in the statute that I had on a, two slides ago. And on the slide you can see that staff groups have been marked out. I left that here because in the past the Board of Accounts audit position was that the extracurricular treasure should not have staff funds, so like teacher funds or just employees of the school corporation account for those funds. We used to tell them that they need to designate a certain individual and they need to account for that money on their own. But we've changed our position in a bulletin article. I'll go over bulletin articles here in a little bit. That anything staff-wise to support their purchases, like if you have a staff account where you buy flowers, in case somebody is deceased or like a birthday or you just want to collect money to support their purchases. Um, we won't take exception to that anymore. We've changed our audit positions. So any staff funds you can keep in the ECA records. Statute also talks about reporting the SA5 to the school board. But Gateway, that whole reporting process, should get you through that requirement. And it just mentions this SA5 report is a public record. Here's another slide that emphasizes our change in our audit position for about staff funds. But I wanted to make the note here that this does not change our position on outside organizations. So again, if there's an outside organization, please don't be accounting for those funds in the ECA records. Indiana Code 20-41-1-4 goes over the forms and records for the extracurricular accounts and that they are prescribed and approved by the Board of Accounts. So all of the records, including your ledger, your purchase order, checkbook, 
etc. They need to be in a certain format, and that format is approved by us. And you can find that in the extracurricular manual, and I will be going over that manual in this presentation. But going back to forms, all ECA forms and records are prescribed by us. There is an approval process detailed in the 2014 March School Bulletin. We call it the School Administrator. And this new form approval process, what it goes over is if, depending on your computer system, if you want to change some of these forms, you can. There's just a process you have to go through. It is essentially putting the form into place, use the form, and then our field examiners will, at the next audit, look at the form and approve it at that time. And the reason that we have to approve these is because we don't want people changing our forms and removing vital areas of the form. The Bolton article goes more in depth, but generally the same information on the forms that are in our manuals need to be collected, and then the function of the form needs to be the same. So for example, if there is a spot on the the check, purchase order, whatever form it is, for an approval of the principal, treasurer, etc., you still need to have that function in the system or in a form that you use. So as long as you collect the same information, you have the same function, most likely we'll approve it in the next audit. Additionally, the cost of all these forms, like if you buy the paper forms from Boyce or another public printer, the cost of these ECA forms need to be paid by the school corporation. You should not be paying for forms out of the ECA records. Statute mentioned there should be separate funds for each class or activity. That kind of goes without saying. Please don't try to group certain groups or ECA funds together. Uh, each, each group needs to have their own fund. And the audits of the extracurricular accounts will be examined by the Board of Accounts as determined by the state examiner. Here's a list of our prescribed forms. In our manual, we have a section for ECA forms. We have a section for school lunch forms, and we have
section for curricular material or textbook rental forms, and then general forms. At some extracurricular accounts, the school lunch and curricular materials, they are accounted for at the ECA level, at the building level. And I will talk about this more later in the presentation, but it can be kept in the ECA accounts throughout the year. There is a statute that allows for school lunch and textbook rental to be kept at the ECA level. But to report to Department of Education, all that activity needs to be sent to the school corporation and included in their records before they report their Form 9. So Department of Education gets that information. In that same Indiana Code, 20-41-1-4, Part B, it talks about the transfers of ECA funds. So funds, they may not be transferred from the accounts of any organization, class, or activity unless you have a majority vote of the members, if there are any members of that group. And then you also need the approval of the principal, the sponsor of that group, and then the treasurer, ECA treasurer. So for the case of athletic funds, there would not be a sponsor per se, the athletic director is regarded as the sponsor, and then the participating students in athletics are not considered members of the fund, so you don't have to get the majority vote like you would a normal group. So for athletic funds to transfer those, you would need the approval of the principal, the treasurer, and then the athletic director. And then the statute also notes that all expenditures of these funds are sh subject to review by the governing body of the school corporation. So the school board at any time can look at these expenditures and question them or just use them for planning purposes, maybe institute internal controls, consider the gov governing body and responsible for the school. Indiana Code 20-41-1-5, it goes over the requirement of the ECA treasurer. These requirements that it notes in statute, it just states that a public school must have a treasurer. So if you have extracurricular accounts, there needs to be an ECA treasurer attached to those accounts, responsible for those accounts. And depending on how the school is set up, in the statute it says like the superintendent can be responsible for it, the school treasurer can be responsible for it, but generally the ECA treasurer is responsible for it. So if you don't have an ECA treasurer, 
then opening of the school year, there needs to be an ECA treasurer named to be responsible for the funds. And then it notes how the, the claim process goes, but I will also go over that in the presentation later. The ECA treasurer can have like a deputy ECA treasurer. They can have a clerk or assistant. Uh, this statute talks about the treasurer not being personally liable for any acts or omissions in connection with the performance of their duties unless the act constitutes gross negligence or an intentional disregard of their duties. So as long as you're doing everything in good faith, you're using our prescribed forms, you reach out to us whenever you have any questions. Um, it should cover all your bases. So again, please reach out to us if you have any questions. Indiana Code 20-41-1-6 goes over the bonding requirements for ECA treasures. These bonding requirements say that the treasurer shall receive a bond in the amount that's going to be fixed by the superintendent and then the principal of the school. If you do not receive more than $300 all year, you don't have to be bonded, but I don't think there's many ECA accounts where that would apply to. So the amount of the actual bond, the surety bond, the insurance coverage, that you are covered for, the Board of Accounts recommends that it covers at least the total amount of anticipated funds that come into the possession of the treasurer at any one time. So just to be able to estimate that, you could go to the prior year and look at your fund balances throughout the months, and then the month with the largest fund balance. I would recommend that you at least be covered for that amount. And again, it's up to the superintendent and the principal to set those amounts. Those bonds need to be filed with the board, and it needs to be a surety that can do business in Indiana. Here, this first bullet point mentions the $300 exception that I mentioned earlier. The statute does not address the specific type of bonding instruments that are allowed, but the Board of Accounts has, have given the position that it may be fulfilled by a comprehensive bonding instrument, like a blanket bond, or even a crime insurance policy would be acceptable as well, as long as the treasurer is covered. There is one caveat regarding the bond. If either school lunch funds or textbook rental funds are handled through an extracurricular account, then instead of the superintendent and the principal approving the bond, it would be the superintendent and the school board approving the bond. The reason for that is that school lunch funds and textbook rental funds, those are considered school corporation funds, and statute gives the ability to account for those at the school level, 
but those that's really school corporation money, and since it's school corporation money that needs to be insured, the school board should be the one approving that bond amount. Indiana Code 20-26-4-5 goes over additional bonding requirements. And essentially what this says is that anyone that has the official duties of receiving, processing, depositing, dispersing, or otherwise having access to public funds needs to be bonded. So this would include any individual. They would not have to be a school corporation employee. They would not have to be working in a financial capacity. It could be a teacher. It could be anybody that receives over $5,000. So if anyone has access to funds, be it a ticket taker, someone collecting money for a fundraiser, maybe a play, donations, etc., if throughout the entire year they fall above that $5,000 limit, then they need to be bonded as well. Here I put some more information just giving kind of an explanation about the official duties, which in the statute that I just highlighted on that last slide, essentially you just have to ask yourself the question, do they have access to public funds, and has they collected over the de minimis of $5,000? If so, they would need to be bonded. Again, that's anybody, a parent, someone that's not an employee of a school corporation. And then we recommend that all bonds, even if it's not a school corporation employee, be filed with the school board. Indiana Code 20-41-1-7 goes over some more responsibilities of the treasurer. So the responsibilities section states that the ECA treasurer, they are responsible for the custody of the assets and disbursement of any funds collected by a collecting authority and expended to pay expenses that are approved by the principal, that are incurred in any athletic, social, or other school function, anything that would fall under that ECA umbrella, and that cost more than $25 during the school year, and that are not paid from public funds. So in this section of the statute, it gives the principal the authority to designate a collecting authority to be in charge of the collection of funds. So someone other than the ECA treasurer, a teacher, some other employee, can be designated as a collecting authority, and they can collect funds for some purpose, like a fundraiser, um, donations for certain purpose, for athletics, etc. Um, we have a separate form for that.
which I'll go over in this presentation later. But when the collecting authority collects the funds, the collecting authority needs to deliver all of the funds together with an accounting of the funds to the ECA treasurer. So when we say accounting of the funds, they should be able to show what they collected, from who they collected, and for what purpose they collected it. I'm not saying that each individual you received money from has to be listed by name, but they should be able to explain the amount of money that they're giving. So I collected, for example, $300 for XYZ fundraiser. It was from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock after lunch. Parents came in and gave their money. I have a tick mark check box here. 20 people, they gave this much money. And that, that would be an accounting of the funds. Just something to explain what they collected so the ECA treasurer has documentation to show the auditors. And in the second bullet point here, um, again, we changed our position and said teacher funds, staff funds could not be in the ECA records, so I marked out the teachers. In Indiana Code 20-41-1-8, it goes over some more duties. It discusses how the ECA treasurer is responsible for keeping an accurate account of money received, all the sources, the balance on hand, and the purposes for what the money was spent on. And if you use our prescribed form, the ECA ledger, which you all have computer systems, I'm guessing by now, but if you just record correctly the, the way you're supposed to in the ledger, that would fulfill this requirement. And then it discusses the SA5 report that needs to be filed with the board, but again, Gateway takes care of that. So here's the SA6. This is the form that we prescribed, and it would essentially be the ECA ledger for an example fund. So you you put the item, the check number, the receipt number, and then what you spent or received, and then the current balance of the fund. It's just a cash basis accounting. And then you just keep a running total. Somewhat simple, but we created that so you'd be compliant with that statute.
This statute also goes over where a school, if they have more than two semesters, how they should file their reports, the timing and things like that. So if you do apply and have more than two semesters in a school year, please look back to that statute just so you, you can be in compliance when providing the reports to the superintendent or the school board. It also addresses when the record should be destroyed. It says that under this section, they shall be kept for five years and they can be destroyed after that, but you should only destroy them if those records have been audited. So if you've had an audit at a particular school and five years have passed, then you would be able to destroy those records. And there's a process with the county where you can get a request to destroy public records and fill out a form, send it to the, the county public records commission, etc. If you contact the county, they'll, they'll give you more information than I am here, but that's sort of the process of how you would go about doing that. Uh, there is a situation where we have not been to extracurriculars for several years just because we were low staffed, we were behind on our audits, and I'm glad to say that we currently are up to date. We are not behind anymore, but there are many extracurricular accounts where we did not get to them until 2015. So we audited a wide range of years in that audit period. And I have heard the deputy state examiner say that we won't be going back and auditing for years prior to 2015. So even if we haven't audited those years before 2015, we, we don't plan to go back. It's up to our discretion. The state examiner can determine when we're going to audit those accounts. So you can get rid of those records by going through that destruction of public record process. It's just going forward, anything after 2015, you need to make sure that we've been there to audit, and it's been five years. Indiana Code 20-41-1-9 mentions that all receipts, all funds, need to be in one bank account. So even if you have multiple funds, multiple grants maybe, you should only have one bank account per extracurricular account. You should not have multiple bank accounts because of the statute. It says there is only to be one bank account. Additionally, receipts shall be deposited without unreasonable delay. Please don't leave cash on your desk in a safe. I guess you can use the safe temporarily until you can get to a bank if you're in a rural area or just until you go to the bank to the end of the day. But don't leave it for a very long time. And in an audit, our opinion is unreasonable would be more than a week. So if you receive money, you have at least uh, seven days until you have to deposit that money. Obviously, you should try to do it as much as possible or as soon as possible. Better internal controls, less risk of losing the money or someone taking the money. But we have given our opinion that seven days is more than seven days is unreasonable. Here's an example of a receipt form. You can see that it's been prescribed by us. It gives a name or a section for the name of the school. The number of the receipt, this should be pre-numbered. 
all these lines should be filled out and then signed by the treasurer. And as you can see on the bottom, it says original. This form should be a duplicate form. So a, a receipt, it must be written on the form each time you receive money, regardless of whether it's in the form of cash, check, money order, EFT, etc. Uh, the original should be signed by the treasurer and then issued to the person paying the money. And the duplicate should be punched for containing in a post binder and serves as the permanent record of the receipt. That record also serves as a source document for posting to the, the ledger of receipts and in the fund ledger. So you can get your daily balance of cash and the record of the deposit. The statute talks about having a control account, and really all that is is the the ledger that I mentioned earlier. It would include the total amount of all of the ECA funds in that ledger, and it would just kind of be a control where you can check that balance, and it should always match the bank account. So posting to this control should be made each day from the receipt and check registers and any amounts that you accumulate by any receipt that you receive or any checks that you write or disperse out. So you can receipt in and disperse things in each individual fund throughout the day, but at the end, the total amounts should be going on that control ledger and you should be matching it to what should be in the bank, depending on timing differences. It talks about subsidiary ledgers being kept, and those would be each of the ledgers that we saw earlier that you can keep for each fund in the ECA accounts. The receipts and the checks, they should be pre-numbered. For each transaction that you have, there should be an identifiable source document along with the the check a receipt so we know when we're testing the records how much who it was to or where it was from etc and here is a, another picture of the SA6 just so you can look at after the prior information was just discussed. In Indiana Code 20-41-1-9, it talks about the investments of the ECAs. So it lists the statutes, Indiana Code 513.10 and 513.10.5. For the investment of state money, those statutes address how public funds can be invested. And you can go look at the statute online, but generally it's for the less risky investments, not like buying stocks, but more for CDs, certificates of deposits, or money market mutual funds, just some of those more liquid investments that are on the conservative side. So those investments that are allowed, those investments can be made at the discretion of the principal. And any interest earned on those investments can be credited to the extracurricular accounts, however the school principal wants. This is one of the items where the principal has complete discretion on how the funds are spent. There should not be a principal fund or a principal discretion fund other than interest on investments. That's the only place in statute that we are aware of where the principal has complete discretion without any other approvals on how to spend that money. The statute talks about that interest money can be used for any school purpose approved by the principal or any extracurricular purpose approved by the principal. It also mentions 
what I mentioned earlier, that receipts should be deposited in the same form which they are received. So for example, if you receive cash and a check, you should not first convert the check to cash and deposit all the cash. You need to deposit the check and deposit the cash. Whatever form you receive it, that's the form you need to deposit. And all disbursements need to be made by check unless you have a board approved credit card policy. And I will be going over that in a little bit. In our ECA manual, we have been of the position to not take exception or in auditor lingo not write up as an audit finding if the school has a general fund, which we call student activity. So if you receive revenues from a function that's not related to a specific group of students, be it from vending machines, uh, picture commissions, things like that, where it's not for a specific class or organization, then you can have a general fund where those revenues go into. And our audit position is that those funds should be spent on the student body as a whole. Since the money came from the student body as a whole, it should be spent on the student body as a whole. So for convocations, for speakers, field trips for the whole student body can participate. Those would be examples of expenditures where the general fund can be used. You shouldn't be spending student activity funds on a specific group of students. So for example, if there's a third grade field trip and you want to use student activity funds for that, uh, you shouldn't unless all students of the student body have the opportunity to participate in that field trip. And really our audit position comes based upon the substance of the transaction. So like I said earlier, if it comes from the students as a whole, it needs to be spent on the students as a whole. If you decide that that would be too hard to do, then the school board can decide to not have a general fund, and then you can allocate all of those revenues that are generated to the student body as a whole to either reduce the prices of vending items, cost of pictures, etc., or you can deposit those and allocate those equally among all funds. We've received questions about the use of general fund or student activity fund money for educational expenditures. And like we said earlier, you should not record anything in the ECA funds that are educational in nature. But the actual spending of the general fund, we don't think that's a great idea. But there's not really anything in statute or compliance guideline prohibiting that. So if the school board would like to use some of the funds on educational type expenditures, then they would need to follow three steps. They would need to have a policy adopted by a school board in a public meeting authorizing these expenditures and providing there's no exceptions from the majority of the student body. That can happen. And then number three, any equipment purchases out of those student activity funds still require approval from the local school board because all equipment purchased needs to be accepted by the board because there could be some instances where the board doesn't want to accept that equipment because it might cost more to maintain than to actually use it. So any equipment purchases need to be approved by the board. And it's our opinion that since alternatives exist for funding educational expenditures, for example, taxes, investment income, there are alternatives other than using student activity fund. So we are emphasizing that the adoption of, the, of any policy to use these general funds would be the responsibility of the school board. We re received more questions about the student activity funds, sp specifically about spellable fees, if they can be paid out of the student activity fund. We won't take exception to the membership fee to, let's say, the Department of Student Programs, which includes the participation in academic competitions, art contests, like student day at the legislator, etc. So the membership fee to be a member can be paid 
as student activity fund, but the specific entry fee for a specific student should not be paid from the student activity fund. It could be paid from the school corporation, operations fund, or just by the participants in the competition. Here is a statute that we also get questions about. It's Indiana Code 20-30-15-6, and it addresses non-session school activities. And this says when public schools are not in session, the governing body may employ personnel to supervise the following. It goes over agriculture education clubs, industrial education clubs, home economics, music activities, athletics, etc. So when the school is not in session, which means there's not classes going on most likely in the summer, any of these activities or camps, like a basketball camp or a football camp, these need to be open and free to all individuals of the school age that's residing in the attendance unit of the school corporation. So if you're having a basketball camp, and it is a school-ran basketball camp, it should be open and free. If there is a fee and a coach wants to have their own basketball or football camp, etc., and they are charging a fee, then technically it would not be the school corporation that's running that camp. It would be the coach or parent or somebody running their own camp. So that's kind of more of an outside organization. So... School needs to realize that the money collected for that camp, it's not school corporation money. It's going to that organizer. And we've seen where that organizer donates it back to the ECA accounts, and then it can be used. But it's really up to that organizer how to use those funds. So if you get in that situation, um, try to be proactive and don't be surprised if you don't receive that money because it really is the outside entity organizing this event. I just went over those camps. It's going to be an outside organization or a booster club. Therefore, the accounting for the receipts and disbursements for those camps for a non-session activity shouldn't be in the ECA accounts. And again, they can donate that back if they choose. In Indiana Code 20-26-4-1, it talks about the duties of the school corporation treasurer and how they are the custodian of all the funds of the school corporation and they're responsible for the proper safeguarding and accounting of the funds. So for any grants or educational fees that are charged, those amounts, if collected at the school level or the extracurricular level, they should be transferred on a timely and regular basis into the school corporation records. We have a separate bulletin that's online that talks about fees in general. It goes over curricular fees and what fees are allowed in statute. And if it doesn't fall under what we listed in that bulletin is not specifically allowed in statute. We've given the opinion that the school corporation attorney should provide written guidance on whether fees that are charged don't go against the Indiana Constitution. Just from our past experience, there are some fees that are collected that should not be in an extracurricular account. So, for example, air conditioning fees, parking fees, bus rider fees, instructional fees, those should go to the school corporation. You can collect it at the ECA level, but they should not be maintained here, and they need to immediately go to the school corporation and not be sitting there because we will take exception if we find that fees are being held in the extracurricular accounts. Here are some more examples of fees that should go to the education fund of the school corporation and not be kept in the ECA accounts. We received questions about like a parking sticker or 
maybe a sign that they hang on their rearview mirror. You can expend from the fund the amount for the parking stickers, but you shouldn't be making a profit on those. So if it's you purchase something for the students to use, it costs a hundred dollars. You charge a hundred dollars and you spend a hundred dollars. You shouldn't be making any money on any of those types of items. If you do, then we would expect that the next round, the money that you made would offset the cost of the next round of whatever you're going to purchase. I wanted to make a mention of Indiana Code 36-1-8-11. This code says that if you adopt a credit card policy and you want to charge a convenience fee because the credit card company is charging you a fee to use their credit card, you can do that. But there's a limit on the fee that you can charge whenever someone swipes their card. It should not exceed $3, and it needs to be uniform regardless of the bank or the credit card. So if you have an American Express or a Chase card, then the fee needs to be the same if you choose to have a fee. And it should be the school board that makes that decision. Indiana Code 5-11-1-27 goes over the internal control requirements of just government units in general. This went into effect, I believe, sometime in 2016, yeah, June 30th of 2016, anytime after that, the school board needs to adopt the minimum standards. And they have to ensure that personnel have been trained on those standards. So once the school board has adopted the minimum standards, and by minimum standards I mean the State Board of Accounts Internal Control Manual on the website. It goes over what internal controls are, how they should be implemented, and what kind of controls should be or recommended to be implemented at the school. Once you adopt those minimum standards, the schools can develop their own set of specific internal controls. And we will be looking at those internal control policies and testing to see if those internal controls were effective. Personnel in statute would be anyone that has the duty of receiving, processing, depositing, dispersing, or otherwise have access to public funds. So anyone that has access to public funds needs to be trained on internal controls. You can be trained by watching our video on the website. There are other videos in case you think ours is too long or it's not as descriptive as you'd like it to be. We've approved other organizations. In the statute, it says the Board of Accounts has to approve the training. So you can't just go out and find some random internal control tra training. It, it might meet the requirements, and if you want to submit something to us to approve, we can approve it if it meets our requirements and put it on our website. But the ones currently on our website are the only videos that are approved. So again, if they meet the definition of personnel, aka having access to public funds, they need to be trained. And this is a one-time training. Once they're trained once, they're trained forever. It's always good to revisit trainings and be on top of the internal control process. But again, if they're trained once, they're trained forever. So what are internal controls? Internal controls are, by definition, a system designed to provide the government reasonable assurance that objectives will be achieved. They're designed to prevent or detect situations in which the government has failed to achieve an objective. 
So there are things like preventative controls, such as requiring dual signatures on checks or having password protected files. So preventative controls, they protect and limit access to business assets. Detective controls find things after the fact. They don't prevent, they detect when things go wrong. Those controls will include reconciling the bank, inventory counts, and these controls are typically performed just periodically throughout the year to see if anything needs to be corrected. And they often turn up internal errors or problems as well as external errors. And external errors, for example, may be a bank error where if you do the reconcilement, you realize you're off by $5. After you do some more research, you realize that the bank charged you $5 and you didn't know about it. So your reconcilement process is a detective control that found that error. So we just went over gateway, we went over many statutes for the extracurricular accounts, and now I'm going to address the Uniform Compliance Guidelines. Indiana Code 511.124 gives the Board of Accounts the ability to establish compliance guidelines, and those guidelines are in our manuals online. We have the school manual, we have the ECA manual, and then we also have bulletin articles. When we issue a bulletin article, that holds the same weight as anything in our manual. So whether you see it in a bulletin, the ECA, or the school manual, all those compliance guidelines you have to follow, and they are available on our website. An important one talks about overdrawn funds. No fund shall be overdrawn. And when I say overdrawn, I mean in the negative or spent over what is actually in the fund. So no fund should be in the red. The ECA treasurer needs to provide the sponsor of whatever fund with their monthly transactions so they know what their balance is. Now, the monthly providing of those balances is not a requirement. It's more of a suggestion just so you avoid an overdrawn fund situation where we might write that up in an audit. And it's really a good internal control that you can implement where you can make comparisons and just make sure you're reconciled and that transactions are correct. And any errors that you find they can be corrected quickly rather than several months in the future where it's hard to recall what actually happened with that transaction. In our compliance guidelines, we talk about mileage. So individuals, if they request mileage for driving personal vehicles for extracurricular purposes, they should use our mileage claim journal 101 form prior to receiving reimbursement. And the reimbursement of the mileage should not include travel to and from the employee's home and the government office unless directly authorized by statute. It should just be from the government office or wherever they're located to the event and then back. Here's an example of the mileage claim form. This is designed to serve as a claim for the mileage reimbursement and can be presented to the school board for the allowance and payment of the mileage. If two or more people ride in the same car, only one mileage reimbursement is allowable. And the odometer reading columns on the form should be used only when the distance between points cannot be determined by like a fixed mileage or Google Maps. Then after the claim has been processed, allowed by the school board, and you've issued the check, it should be filed numerically with the other claims in the same period. One thing for teachers, if travel is required of a teacher in order to hold classes in more than one location during the year, the amount of the reimbursement for the travel should be stated in their contract and drawn periodically, used as this form allows.
So cash donations that are extracurricular in nature, they can be accounted in an extracurricular account. Any school corporation donations made directly to the school corporation needs to be accounted for in the school corporation records. So on the first bullet point, I put cash. And the reason I put that is because any property or equipment donated to the school needs to be accepted by the school board. All donations, for that matter, needs to be accepted by the school board, but specifically any equipment the board has to approve. So that should be sent to the school corporation and go through their processes. So donations can be kept at either the school corporation level or the extracurricular level. It just depends for what purpose the donations are for. Be it educational in nature, school corporation related, or extracurricular related. It is important that the expenditures are approved by the principal. They should fall within the general policies of your school. If you've implemented internal controls and you've put in your internal control policy that XYZ employees should review XYZ document in XYZ situation, then you need to be following the policies that you have implemented. And in an audit, we will be checking to see that you follow statute, you follow our guidelines on our website, and also your local policies. And distribution of ECA funds to students or teachers should not occur unless specifically stated in statute. This is an example of the purchase order in the accounts payable voucher. It's called the SA-1. It's to be used when a purchase is made for delivery at a later date. So the form is to be executed in full and signed by the person authorizing the purchase for the particular activity in question. Before the activity is permitted to use the purchase order in AP form, extracurricular treasurer must determine if there is sufficient balance in the fund to make payment upon receipt of the merchandise. So this form helps with your internal control process just to check to see if there is money available before you spend it. This form is in triplicate and should be pre-numbered. These must be prepared by the treasurer of the ECA account or issued by pads to the activities or by set as required for their immediate needs. So when the form's prepared, the original is given to the vendor. And then the duplicate copy and the file copy, which is the triplicate, sh should be re retained by the treasurer and then filed in an obligation file by the fund. And that serves as a notice that the expense has been incurred against that fund. And it also enables the treasurer to see that no further purchase orders are issued against that particular fund if that fund is depleted or does not have money left. So operationally, how this works is when the shipment is made, the vendor will send an invoice to the school. And then the shipment received by an activity must be verified with the invoice and the voucher, which would be the duplicate copy. And they should be checking for the quantity and the price by the person who is designated to receive the items. Then the person receiving the shipment indicates on the voucher that they have received and checked the shipment, and then that is forwarded to the treasurer, who then makes the payment after signing the certification required at the bottom of this SA-1. So then after payment, the check number and the date of the voucher is entered on the duplicate copy before filing it, and it may be a good idea to file this in a specific vendor file so you can keep all vendor payments together. It's easier to do research, go back and look if there's any problems. And then once this is paid, you can move this file copy from the obligation file and then you can place it in numerical order along with the vendor invoice in your own filing system. The claim for payment is the SA-7 form, and it serves the same purpose as a purchase order, but 
the purchase order is used before someone presents something to you for payment. So this should be used in all situations where purchase orders are not used. So for example, purchases from deliver delivery salesmen, if they show up at your door, or services of officials at the athletic events where they perform a service or you purchase something immediately and need to pay them, then you can fill out this claim for payment form. You don't have to send them a purchase order and then they give you an invoice. You can use this instead. The signatures are required by the person authorized to purchase. And then you should acknowledge that you have received the goods or services on this form. As you can see at the bottom, the treasurer is required to sign it. And then after you pay the claim, you can file these in numerical se sequence. This is our prescribed form for checks. It is the SA-2. It notes the fund, the purchase, if you paid a PO or a claim, or an yeah, invoice associated with the payment, you can note those on here. It comes in a duplicate, where the original one you give to, obviously, the person you're paying. And then the duplicate will serve as the permanent record in the, the check register. Checks need to show the, the date the payee, the amount, the purchase order number, the activity the fund is charged to. The invoice one is optional, but it's always good to keep there for an audit trail. The check needs to be signed by the treasurer and then countersigned by the principal or another designated official at the school. So when you post to the control account that I mentioned earlier, that ledger that you have from our other prescribed form, uh, you'll, you'll be doing that from the duplicate checks in the register by an individual basis, or you can do it by the daily totals. You just need to be aware that you should be charging the individual fund, and then at the end of the day or periodic times throughout the day, the control account should also match the total of all the funds. So this slides on the school lunch program, and from a Board of Accounts perspective, the preferred method of accounting for a school food and nutrition program is through a school lunch fund in the school corporation records. But as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there is authority in Indiana Code 20-41-2-4 to account for the school lunch program in the extracurricular records. And I mentioned earlier, but as a reminder, if you do account for school lunch program in the ECA records, the school board should be the one determining the amount of the bond and approving the bond. If you do deal with school lunch as an ECA treasurer, you should be aware that a prepaid school lunch fund should be recorded. I put the the fund number here, 8400. You don't really need to know that. The school corporation should know that. But this prepaid fund, what it is, is when students go through the lunch line, they, they prepay for food, where they give $20, $100 in advance. That amount should go into the prepaid food fund. This is because this is federal money that we're dealing with, and there are multiple federal requirements that require the school to track when someone goes through the lunch line and charges the amount. And that would be program income at the time that they actually spend that money. So we don't want prepaid money being counted in the program income when we do federal testing. And, and that student will have a balance next to their name. You should add up all of the student balances, and at the bottom of the total of all the student balances, that should match your prepaid food fund. So just make sure those match and reconcile together, and you can avoid an audit finding. We have prescribed forms in the SBOA manual that are specifically for school lunch. They start with SF for School Food Service. So there are forms, the SF2, 3, and 4, that allow for you to account for these prepaid transactions.
So again, for the curricular materials rental or the textbook rental fund, we have the same position as school lunch where the preferred method of accounting for a textbook rental program is in the school corporation records. There is authority in Indiana Code 20-41-2-5 where textbook rental can be accounted for at the ECA level. And again, if that money is at the ECA level, the school board should be approving the bond of the treasurer. Here is a form that you can use to complete an inventory of your textbooks. In our compliance guidelines, you're supposed to take an inventory of all assets and supplies. And here is the official receipt for an individual that is renting textbooks. As of February 7th of 2020, the statute allows for you to charge 25% of the textbook. It used to be different a couple years ago where it went down to 15% and you could not continually charge the 25% after so many years. Currently, you can charge 25% of the historical cost of the textbook back to the student as long as they're using it, and it's not limited to four years. You can continue to charge that amount up to that amount as long as your school board decides to do that for that textbook. In our compliance guidelines, we have a collection of amounts due guideline. And that says that governmental units, they have a responsibility to collect amounts owed. So if there are amounts owed and you're not taking any actions to collect those amounts, you don't have a policy to collect bad debts, then it, it's likely that we will place a finding in your audit report. Speaking about bad debts, the governing body of any government unit needs to have a written policy concerning the procedures for writing off bad debts. Even if you currently do not have any bad debts, if you collect 100% textbook rental, that would be impressive, but still you need to have a bad debt account policy. In our prior ECA manual, we had the compliance requirement where the school board had to approve every single fundraiser, and while the school board is ultimately responsible for all the fundraisers that the school runs, and they should be doing that just from an internal control perspective, but we understand the logistical concerns with that, so we remove that, and that's not currently a compliance requirement, but the school board still needs to accept and approve all donations received. We receive questions about where the fundraising activities should be accounted for. And we have not found any statutes that address who actually has control over fundraising activities. So therefore, we won't take exception to the local school board passing a policy. And they can deter determine, they can do it by specific fundraiser or just fundraiser in general. Um, just how they're going to be ran, what is actually a school fundraiser in contrast with an outside organization fundraiser, and if school property can be used, etc. But that is a local decision. So in absence of a policy, our opinion would be that each fundraising activity needs to be looked at individually to determine if the school corporation is running it or an outside organization is running it. Um, and that's going to be the Board of Accounts that makes that determination. So it's in your benefit to have a fundraising policy. The so things to keep in mind would be that the school employees, if they are participating in fundraising activities on school time, then that fundraising activity should be counted in the school records, or you can run the risk of ghost employment issues. This slide is on donations to outside organizations. So we won't take exception to any clubs or organizations donating money to an outside organization based upon a majority vote of members. You just need to keep that documentation 
to show us that the majority members actually approved, just something written down saying that you had a vote, or if the fund in question, for example, is like the junior class, you don't have to go and get the whole student body to take a vote. Um, we've accepted that the elected members of the junior class, like the, the president, the vice president, the secretary, etc., of the junior class, they can make that decision for their junior class, and just you can just document that vote instead. But one important thing to know is that the warrant or check should be written to an organization, just not to an individual. So there is a compliance requirement in the ECA manual where checks should not be given to an individual as far as donations are concerned. So we get the question if, for example, a student's house burnt down and you want to have a fundraiser to help the family. And once you raise the fundraiser, you disperse the money. You can't just, just write an individual a check because of that compliance requirement. So if you get in those kind of situations, I'd recommend that you work with an outside organization, maybe a not-for-profit organization in the community where you can get an agreement with them to provide them the funds. So you could write this organization and they'll provide a service where they can help this family. Or you could purchase items for the family and then hand them the items as well. This position on gift cards and credit cards are in our bulletin articles, but I have summarized it here on these couple slides. So we will not take exception to the use of gift cards or credit cards by an extracurricular unit, provided the following criteria are observed. So the school board needs to authorize the use of gift cards or credit cards, normally through a resolution, and should be approved in the board minutes. In that resolution, it should be stated what the purpose of the gift card or the credit card will be. In that resolution, the purchase and issuance of gift cards or credit cards needs to be handled by a designated official or employee. Uh, you can delegate that to the principal to decide. Um, Number four, the designated responsible official or employee needs to maintain an accurate log where it would include the, the name of the business from which the, the gift cards were purchased or where the credit card, if you use it, what you bought with it, what fund you used, what account you used, the date that you made that expenditure or you issued the card. And you, you need to keep track who at all times has that card. It needs to be a chain of custody documented where it should go to person A, B, and C in these situations, and then at the end of the day, or at the end of an hour, however you want to make your policy, um, it should be returned to the person that it was issued to, most likely the principal or the ECA treasurer. Gift cards and credit cards, they should not be used to bypass the accounting system. Um, one reason that purchase orders are issued is to provide the fiscal officer with the means to encumber and attract appropriations so that the school board and sponsors and any other officials, just they just know what their balance is and they can make accurate decisions. Number six, so with the procedures for any payments, they should be no different than any other claim. School principal still needs to approve the expenditure if it's from the credit card and it should not be based upon the credit card's statement alone should be for each expenditure and then supporting documentation needs to be available such as paid bills receipts etc This slide is over vending and concessions and other sales. This is the controls. So internal controls over vending operations or concessions, etc. 
should include at a minimum a regular reconcilement of the beginning inventory, purchases, distributions, and items sold with an ending inventory to the amount received. Any discrepancies noted in the inventory should be immediately documented in writing to the proper officials, so the school business officials, school treasurer, and then they can forward that to the school board. The reconcilement should provide an accurate accounting of the inventory. If you do have any discrepancies, just document how you address that. And then the persons with access to vending, they should be properly designated. And then their access needs to be limited to only those people that are designated. So there, there should be a clearly defined procedure adopted by the government unit concerning the placement, the use, the maintenance, and then the commissions and or profits of the vending machines. All revenues generated and costs incurred in operating the vending machines should be accounted for through the ECA records. If the vending machines are located in restricted areas, other than those available to the public, and the government body and the CEO wish for those revenues to be restricted for the use and benefit of those employees, then you can have a separate fund, like a staff fund, in the ECA records, and we will not take exception to that. But those decisions, they need to be authorized by a resolution passed by the governing body. For the vending machines that are located in public areas, the use of the machines that generate the, the revenues, we advise the local officials that those revenues be placed in the general fund, the student activity fund, like we spoke about earlier, and be used for the benefit of the general public which would be the machine users. So any alternate procedures that are adopted, they need to be noted in a resolution approved by the governing body. So if personnel other than the government units personnel, so other than school employees, if they maintain stock and clean up around the vending machines, we won't take exception if those persons are paid for those services, but a written agreement should be entered into, and that agreement should list the services that are going to be rendered, the amount paid, going to be paid for those services, the timing of the payments, and then any other areas deemed necessary to be addressed by the government unit should be in the agreement. So again, if any vending machine is accessible to the students or the public, then the proceeds should go into the Student Activity Fund. I have some yellow wording down here that provides a new audit position where if it's restricted to just faculty and staff and you want to use those proceeds to the staff, you can have a staff fund. This is the Accountable Items Review form, which is the SA-9. This form should also be pre-numbered and prepared in duplicate by the treasurer. So the original copy would go to the principal, and then the duplicate would be retained in numerical order with the treasurer. This form is to be used at least once a year at the end of the school year. And the form is used to help account for beverages sold from vending machines. However, this form can be used at the discretion of the school to account for other items such as concessions, books, etc. Uh, th this should not be used to account for revenues from exclusive or franchise contracts.
on our website, we do have a school page. I have pasted the link here. And on this page, we have our bulletins, we have our manuals, we have the internal control training, internal control manual, state examiner directives, gateway information, statutes. We summarize the statutes on our website as well. Essentially, everything that was in this manual is somewhere on this page. So if you have any questions, again, please reach out to us in our email, but you can also find it on our website. We also have best practices. We recently released a glossary of accounting and audit terms. So if some of the terms that I said during this presentation, if they didn't make sense, you can go to that glossary and look up just general accounting or auditing terms. We have our audit reports and examination reports on the website, where if you are a new ECA treasurer, I'd recommend that you look at your prior audit report. And if we noted any findings, or audit comments that you take a look at those and see if they're addressed and if the issue is still ongoing because I can guarantee that we will follow up on prior comments in our next audit. Thank you for listening. I hope you have learned something. I hope this is a good resource for you in the future to come back and review. But again, our website has information, but if you want to email us questions, feel free to do so. That's what we're here for. Uh, my name is Chase Lennon. My partner's name is Jonathan Weininger. And you can reach us both at our email schools.townships at sboa.in.gov. Thank you.